Well, good morning. So if you're driving down the road and you see a giant golden M up in the air, some smiles, some little chuckles, you know what that means and is nearby. How about the swoosh check mark, especially if you're one of those really gifted athletes that gets the sponsorships. If you see the swoosh check mark, what does that mean? Nike. Or if you're up in the Oak Brook Mall and you're walking along with your wife and you see all of these stores that have the names and the descriptions of what they are, and you come to this store that just has this giant apple with a bite taken out of it. And you walk in and you know exactly what you're going to be getting. These symbols are icons that we as people, we just know them. They become like second nature as we see them time and time again. We don't even know, need to know the language or what is behind it. We can recognize it as the symbols. But symbols point us to something else, usually something greater. We can recognize restaurants and clothing brands from anywhere in the world, even without the language. The symbol doesn't rely on language because it is a picture of something greater. The Christian faith also uses symbols. The cross, as we not only sing about, as we read about, and as preached about, the cross is the most fam famous symbol in the Christian faith. But it's not the only. Communion is another symbol of the Christian faith. The night before he died, Jesus used communion as a symbol. If you are joining us for the first time, we are continuing our series in the Gospel of Mark. The shortest gospel, only 16 chapters. But in this, we see Jesus is full of action. He doesn't sit still. He is a man that is on a mission to save his people and to fulfill God's mission for him. And so if you turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark this morning, we're going to be looking at only four verses in Mark chapter 14, verses 22 through 25. But today's passage, as we get to that, it fits in the larger event of Passover. You may remember Passover. You may have seen the Prince of Egypt. You may have seen some of the old TV shows that depict Passover. And a very important holiday in the Jewish faith. It's when the Jewish people celebrate God's faithfulness. Thousands of years ago, the Israelites were freed from slavery in Egypt. And every year, the people remember their liberation with a celebration. Jesus and his friends, they were no exception. They all joined in for one Passover meal together. And it's here that Jesus connects the Passover lamb to himself. God demands a sacrifice for his people. We see that all the way back in the book of Genesis, where God demands a sacrifice for the sins of the people. And Jesus connects that Passover lamb to himself. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Here at Judson, we practice communion twice a month. Maybe you aren't sure why we take communion. Maybe for the, this is your first time here at Judson, or maybe you've been to some other churches and you aren't sure. Why do people get together, they say some words, and then they get these really stale crackers in this juice that nobody really likes? And why do they do that on a regular basis? Why do Christians take communion? Well, that's what we're going to discuss this morning. Because communion is a significant practice for the Christian faith. Communion has much meaning because it points us back to the forgiveness of God and his love for his people. Communion symbolizes much more, however, than God's love. Today, after our message, we will share communion together. You will see the crackers. You will taste the juice. You will hear music and you will hear scripture read. But there is so much more than even meets the eye, which leads to our big idea this morning. In communion, there is much more than meets the eye. The friends of Jesus thought they were just celebrating the Passover meal. They didn't know what was going to happen next. We can look back at our Bibles and we can plod along and we can see, well, Peter's going to do this. John is going to do this. 
but they were living it. They didn't know what was going to happen next. These friends of Jesus, they ate the bread and drank the wine. But these ordinary things represents God's extraordinary grace and his amazing promise that applies to you and applies to me this morning. So let's begin in verse 22 of chapter 14 in the Gospel of Mark. And as they were eating, he, meaning Jesus, took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. So the Passover meal begins as it would at any other time. It's been practiced for thousands of years. Jesus and his friends, they were eating. That's an important clue. Most events, even today, most important transactions happen over food. Can you think back to the first time, if you're married, the first time that you went on a date with your future spouse? Can you think of the dates that you may have gone on if you were not yet married? or you're not married at all, and can you think over the significant times that you have spent with people? And it's usually over food. You don't hear of many lives in history that have been changed over a snack. So after this meal of the lamb, this giant feast, Jesus takes the bread, and he says something strange. We as Christians, we hear it, but to hear them to hear those words for the first time, put yourself in the position of those disciples, of those friends of Jesus. Take, this is my body. Now, this isn't a part of the script. Moses didn't institute this. The Israelites didn't practice this for thousands of years before Jesus came along. He brought it up. The Jewish people had been reciting the same words for hundreds of years, and God saved his people from slavery in Egypt, and they remembered that. But now Jesus connects this ancient practice to himself? That's a big claim. For those, even in our modern society, that believe Jesus was just a good teacher, he taught some things that we should abide by, love your enemies, care for the poor, do these actions and follow my example. But here Jesus is making a radical claim that we cannot miss, even if we are Christians. If you are a skeptic to the faith this morning, we are glad you're here. But I would encourage you to consider the claims of Jesus because they are revolutionary. Again, there is more than meets the eye with communion. But let me highlight an important word in this packed sentence. If you take a look into your Bibles again and you see in verse number 22, you'll come to the word body. The word body, that doesn't just mean the flesh, that doesn't mean the skin, but what Jesus is talking about, I am giving my whole self to you. Jesus gives up everything for his people. In other words, Jesus says this bread that you are about to eat represents who I am. What I'm about to do over the next few days, friends, is for you. Jesus is going to lead his people to freedom through his death and through his resurrection. The sacrifice of Jesus' body will save God's people from the chains of slavery. The Jewish people, they had known slavery and oppression. From the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Persians, and now the Romans. But Jesus offers a different kind of freedom because he is a different kind of king. As we have consistently talked about through the Gospel of Mark, we see that Christ claimed to be king, but it is a different kind of king. Now, I've personally never been good at magic tricks. I've never really known how you can pull a rabbit out of the hat. Some people can easily figure that out, and I'm astounded by those people. How do they cut the assistant in half? Or even the little card tricks. I'm the guy who sits in the front row when the grandpa is showing the kids the card tricks and they get it. And I'm still asking, how did he do that? I I don't understand how those magic tricks work. Yes, I know it's not magic. I get that. Things are not as they seem. For magic tricks, there is more than meets the eye. Jesus isn't doing magic. He's not an illusionist. He's not a magician. He's not trying to trick his friends. 
But there is more to the bread than these people realize. Christians have disagreed over communion for centuries. If you're one of those history buffs, those history nerds that can that remember some of the aspects of history, I'm sorry, we're not going to get really into that. But a couple of aspects of what churches have believed and taught over communion is important for us to recognize. The Catholic Church began teaching in 1215. So this is a thousand years after Jesus had lived. They taught that the bread actually becomes the body of Jesus. The bread changes or transforms into the body of Jesus. Some Protestant churches, they believe that Christ is spiritually present. It doesn't actually change, but it, there is some spiritual element to the bread and to the cup. Another perspective, a third perspective, views communion as a symbol as a symbol. The bread is the symbol of the body, his whole being. Again, he's talking about his body being the whole being. He's given up everything. To get together, when we take communion, we here at Judson, we practice. Jesus is symbolizing what the bread is, what it represents. But do not believe, think that this is just some empty ritual. It's not a meaningless symbol. Because you might only see the bread and the juice, but there is more than meets the eye. The Holy Spirit works through our celebration to deepen our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So what does this history lesson mean for us as a church? First, there are two actions that we can take today. There are two things that we can take. The first is we are called to recognize the mystery within communion. We don't have it all figured out. If you, can you think back to how you were last year? And I really hope you don't need to put your hand up, but is there something that you learned this year that you didn't know last year? I really hope so. We are constantly learning aspects, not just about the Bible, but not just about life, but also about God's creation. There is a mystery behind communion, because we don't understand it all. We don't have it all figured out. Because you and I are not God. There are some things we just won't understand. But does that mean every way is correct? No. But this is not the most important doctrine in the Christian faith. There are many essential doctrines that we as Christians must abide by. Jesus really is God. He really did die on the cross. He really did physically raise from the dead. And as we have said over and over again, we know that God's Word is true. And because God's Word is true, therefore we can follow it. Everything in God's Word is true, but not everything in God's Word is clear. Not everything is clear. So we humbly recognize there is a mystery to communion. Second, we remember. So first, we recognize the mystery. Second, we remember. You are getting more than just a sample of a salting cracker. You are getting the grace of God. We remember the grace that God has given to His people. His whole being. The next day after the Passover meal, Jesus gave up everything. Can you picture the pain that Jesus was feeling? Not just on the cross, but of leaving his friends. He sacrificed himself for forgiveness. And every time you take the bread, I would encourage you to recognize and remember. Recognize the mystery of God's love for you and the knowledge. And also to remember the sacrifice he made. So if you're driving down the street and you see a giant H on a sign, what do you think is nearby? Usually a hospital. Usually a hospital. If you see a giant H, you see that a hospital is probably nearby. The H, the H however, this is not medical advice. I am not a doctor. The H is not the hospital. The doctors do not work there. The power of communion is not in the bread or in the cup. The power is in the one behind the bread and the cup. 
The one behind the bread has the power to make a promise. A promise that means more than we could ever imagine. And in communion, there is more than meets the eye. Let's continue on in verse 23. And Jesus took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they all drank it. They all drank it. After the bread, Jesus hands each of them the cup. And they all drank it. Why is that important? Think back to if you've ever seen any of the movies, The Passion of the Christ, or any movies, or any children's stories, what happens to the disciples after Jesus is is arrested? They leave. They run. They flee. They're out of there. After the Roman government comes in and after they wish them away, they hide. Or they follow at a very, very safe distance. So why is that important? Because it gives me hope. Every one of them would fail Jesus the next day. Have you ever gotten a bad test grade? Have you ever gotten a verbal warning from a boss? And you felt like a failure? You felt this kind of shame, this forgottenness that you have little worth. Some would run away and hide while Peter, the leader of the group, he would deny that he even knew Jesus. The friends, the disciples, the heroes of the faith? No. They messed up a lot. But here's some good news. As Jake read earlier, communion, the Christian faith is based on grace. Communion is based on grace, not good works. Being a Christian is not about how well you obey, but how you trust in how well Jesus obeyed. Communion points to Jesus as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. So how might we respond to that? One, communion should humble us. When when you get the communion cup and the cracker, it's called to humble us, to recognize I don't have it all figured out. I am entirely and utterly reliant upon God and His grace for everything, for anything good in my life. But that also gives us hope. So we are humbled and we are given hope. I'm humbled by the fact that Jesus invited the table to the table cowards like the disciples, failures like Peter. And I'm also comforted by the fact that he invited sinners like me. Because I know how I have disobeyed Jesus. You know how you have disobeyed God's word. Yet we are all offered hope. Because communion reminds us that all of Jesus' work on the cross is finished finished. We have nothing to bring to the table but our open hands ready to receive. Can we try that right now? Just real quietly. I'm not going to ask anyone to raise your hands. Just Can you just quietly in your lap, can you just put your hands out? And we'll close our eyes. And so can we just pray a little prayer with our, with our eyes closed and with our hands open? Can we pray this? Father, we thank you for your grace. Communion is such a beautiful picture of your forgiveness. It's through your Son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. And it's this next verse that gets to the heart, the root of the passage. Verse 24. And Jesus said to them, This is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many. See, the disciples, the friends of Jesus, they knew the importance of blood. Ancient Jewish thinkers, they believed that blood was the very life of a person. So when Jesus says, this is my blood, they knew what he was talking about. But his words, this is my blood, echo, this is my body. This is myself, my very being. Moms, can you picture when you first gave birth to your baby? Can you picture this child I am responsible for for the rest of my life? Kids, can you picture, whether you're a young child or you're an adult child, can you picture the love that you had for your parents? There was a covenant. But what about the word covenant? A covenant is a serious promise 
an agreement, a contract. What does Jesus mean by blood of the covenant? You might remember Moses, the leader of the Israelites, smashed the Ten Commandments. In the Old Testament book of Exodus, Moses threw the blood of the Lamb on the people of God to seal God's covenant with them. Now, it may seem gross. We may not even like to see any kind of blood, or if we get a scratch, then we panic quite a bit. But if blood contains the life of a being, then the blood needs to cover the people and their sins. Again, symbols, pictures. When a man and a woman get married, they enter into a covenant. They make promises or vows to one another. And what is one of the symbols of their covenant? The ring. The ring is a picture, a covenant of that everlasting, never stopping promise that a man makes to his wife. The ring points to the promise that a husband makes to his wife and a wife to her husband. Again, the idea of blood may sound gory to you. But what Jesus is saying about this covenant is this. I am signing away everything with this covenant. Everything. Jesus is giving up everything for you. I will, my, I will fulfill my promise to you. In a world of broken promises and deception, Jesus keeps his word. God is faithful to his promises. But there is more than meets the eye here. Are you sensing a theme yet? And that the Bible is a collection of 66 books, but they're all telling one story. The Bible has 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New, but they're all telling one beautiful, glorious, majestic story about how a king saves his people. And communion is the picture of that. The Old Testament makes a lot of references to sacrifices. And those sacrifices in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, point towards Jesus as the final and ultimate sacrifice. The Old Testament describes the Passover meal when God saved Israel from Egypt. That meal points to Jesus as the ultimate Savior of not just the Israelites. God didn't just come for the Israelites, but for all people. Communion uses imagery and symbols to point towards Jesus. Not just what he has done, but also what he will do in the future. It's not just about the forgiveness of our past sins, but it also looks forward to what Jesus will do in the future. Let's end on verse 25. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When Jesus says the word truly, or the Greek word amen, that means he is saying, listen up, this is important. Pay attention, I've got something to say that will change your life. Guys, I'm going to die, he says. I'm finishing my work here, but I will be back. I will be back. And it will be better than ever more than you can imagine. We can get discouraged in today's society. We can get down on the state of affairs, whether those are political, economic, social, what have you. But the Christian faith does not disregard what is happening here. We're called to be realist, but we can look forward to what God will do. One day Jesus will, ret will return. We don't know when, but he will. So what does that mean for us as a church today? Again, we can recognize and remember. When you recognize that Jesus is a good king, you can take him at his word. You can trust his promises. Because Jesus is wise, there are some things we just don't understand. When I was a kid, I didn't understand everything that my parents did for me or told me to do. There are some things I still don't understand. But because Jesus is wise, we can trust him at his word. Just like communion in life, there is more than meets the eye. We don't know everything, but we can know the one who does know everything. 
Friends, when you remember that Jesus is coming back, you can rest. We can rest. You don't have to be in control of everything. Because God is. Because God's sovereignty He cares for us. We can recognize God in his sovereignty and we can remember his goodness. Symbols stir up all kinds of emotions. When some people see the Starbucks or the Dunkin' logo, you might be like some family members of mine, I won't say whom, that love Dunkin'. But they can smell the warmth. When others see the Cubs logo, they are taken back to their first game at Wrigley. Communion helps us remember the goodness of our God. Taking communion together, not individually, but together, shows us that we aren't alone. In just a few moments, we're going to take communion together as a congregation, as a called out body, as a people. If you have trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior and King, then we welcome you at this table. We would love for you to join us, whether you are a member of this church or not. If you have trusted in Jesus Christ alone as your Savior and King, we welcome you. If you're still considering the Christian faith, if you're still not sure yet about this God, that's okay. We're glad you're here. I would politely and out of respect for you, I would ask you to refrain from taking communion. Simply place your hands on the lap, on your lap, and as our deacons come by, they'll recognize that you're wanting to refrain from from communion. But I would ask you to consider the claims of the Christian faith at this time. If you are a believer, but there is some unrepentant sin, or here's a tough one, if you are in open conflict with another believer, I would encourage you to pray about refraining from taking communion. Because Jesus tells us in Matthew 5 that we are called to make peace with our brothers before we engage in communion. Jesus instructs us to make peace with others. The Apostle Paul instructed the church at Corinth to know why they were sharing in communion together. Let me read that passage. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took it after supper, saying, The cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The deacons are going to pass out communion. And as you receive the cup, I would encourage you to please hang on to it. In just a few moments, we will take it together as a people. I grew up in the dark ages. My family had a phone that required us to actually press buttons if we wanted to call our friends. Connecting to the internet took about five minutes and made me feel like my desktop computer was blasting into cyberspace. There were no self-checkouts. We actually had to wait in line for the cashier to ring up our groceries and then painfully wait for dad to write the check. If I wanted to share a picture with my family and friends, I would need to take my film to the camera bar and get doubles printed. If mom forgot to put dinner in the crock pot before she left for work, we were eating PB&J for dinner. Sadly, there was no Uber Eats. The world today is obsessed with instant gratification. Buy now, pay later. Instant pots, instant lunch, instant cure, instant wealth, instant success, instant everything. Money talks, and it usually says, gotta have it now. But spending everything we have in order to have all of the things we want is a recipe for trouble. Often we get in a huge hurry to spend our money. We don't want to wait. We want what we want and we want it all now. That's a dangerous mindset to have. 
In our story today at Kids Connect, you are going to learn the devastating consequences of not being able to wait. Most of us would agree that good things come to those who wait. Faster doesn't usually mean better, and practically anything worth having requires time and effort. I have a question for you. Who created you? That's right, God. And who knows the future? That's right, God. And who wants what is best for you? That's right, God. So why wouldn't you trust God to lead and guide you in your money decisions instead of trusting in money and listening to what money has to say about, spend me now? Listen to God, trust his timing, and experience the incredible blessings he has for you.